In this video, I'm going to explain Faraday's law. This is the second video in the four Maxwell's equations series. Last time I explained Gauss's law, which is known as the first of Maxwell's four equations. I'm now moving on to the third one, Faraday's law. You might be wondering, why skip the second equation? Well, as you can see, since both the first and third equations are about the electric field, I thought it would make more sense to cover them first. The first one was about the divergence of the electric field, and now we're going to talk about the curl of the electric field. Sounds good? So, as you might have guessed, Faraday's law is named after the English physicist Michael Faraday. Before we start, I would recommend watching my previous video on gradient, divergence, and curl if you haven't already. And if you haven't seen the one on Gauss's law either, I think it's a good idea to check that out too. It'll make this video easier to follow. Alright, let's start. We have learned that electric fields spread. Now the question is, can they also rotate? When we think about different situations involving electric fields, we can roughly categorize them like this, right? So let's look at the first one. Is the electric field rotating? No, it's just spreading out. What about the second one? Not rotating either. So far, it seems like the curl of the electric field is just zero. Now, what about this one? It definitely looks like the field is curling. But you know what? Surprisingly, the curl of this one is also zero. The curl of E being zero can also be written this way. And it's actually easier to understand using this expression rather than this one. We gotta first talk about how the two expressions are equivalent. They're related through Stokes' curl theorem. We have vectors here. They could be representing wind directions or streams of water. Now, if you look at the center, you'll see that the two vectors there cancel each other out. So in reality, the vectors that nature actually feels are the remaining ones. The same idea applies even on a large scale. Make sense? Now, say this small loop is the curl of a vector field V. Then this one should be the curl of V as well. Each of these little cycles is also the curl of V. If you add up all the cycles inside this area, so integrated over the area, the overall vector should be the same as the rotation of V along the outer path P, right? Because all of the rest inside cancel each other. So they're mathematically the same thing. You might be asking, V times DL here makes sense because they follow the same path pointing in the same direction the whole time, right? But what about the curl of V times the area here? How is this multiplication possible? Well, the curl of V should be pointing upward according to the right-hand rule, right? And the direction of the area is determined by its normal vector, so they're in the same direction. There's no problem with this curl V dot DA. One thing to remember is that Stokes' curl theorem only applies to closed path. I mean, otherwise we cannot have an area, right? So this is Stokes' curl theorem, okay? It makes sense, right? They are mathematically the same thing. Now, let's go back to what we were talking about. The vectors are in fact curving, but let's try to make a closed path. Uh, let's consider it counterclockwise for convenience. You know, the right hand rule is for the counterclockwise rotation. You could do it clockwise. It should still give the same result. Anyway, so the lower part of the path goes in the same direction as the electric field colored in blue. So that gives us just E times DL. But the upper part moves in the opposite direction to the electric field. So that would be negative E times DL. When you add them together, they cancel out basically zero. So by Stokes' theorem, that means this is also zero. And since the right-hand side is zero anyway, we can just get rid of this integral, right? 
I know, I know, you may ask, what if we pick a different close path? Or what if one charge is stronger than the other charge? Or what if there are many charges, so that there's no symmetry in any path at all? Something like this. Well, none of that actually matters. Electric fields get weaker radially, right? Because it's r over squared. So the longer the path, the weaker the electric field. The shorter the path, the stronger the electric field. And they still end up canceling each other out. You don't believe me? If you want to be convinced mathematically, I'll show you, of course. Say we have a random path. Let's integrate the electric field over this path. We'll get this expression, right? But think about it. If r2 equals r1, meaning we're back where we started, then this inside the bracket becomes 0, right? So yeah, for a closed path, some functions may not give 0, but at least when it comes to the electric field, the result is always 0. I know the last one looks a bit tricky, I agree. Because we cannot make any closed path, right? This is just how I interpret it. But you know how the tangent function goes to infinity and then come back up from negative infinity? If you think of that as a kind of single path, I mean, since we can express it with a single function, we could treat it as effectively closed. So far, we were able to investigate the electric field using these diagrams which are based on Michael Faraday's idea of lines of electric forces. This was one reason why we call it Faraday's law. There's another very important reason though. I'll tell you that in a second. But is the curl of an electric field always zero then? Faraday discovered that when a magnetic field is present, it can induce an electric field that curls around it. Here's an important thing though. Watch this. As you can see, to be more precise, it actually takes a time-varying magnetic field to create an electric field. So the curl of E does exist when there's a magnetic field that is changing. And here we have a negative sign because this curling electric field is induced by the magnetic field. What I mean is, it's not the electric field of the original magnetic field, it's a newly created electric field of the resisting magnetic field. Again, right and rule applies. Lastly, you may be asking, isn't that thing going through the wire the electric current, not the electric field? Current is basically the result of how much charge flows due to the electric fields. So if current is flowing in a certain direction, then the electric field must be pointing that way too. You know, current actually points in the opposite direction of the moving electrons, right? The electric field also points away from the positive charge, so they end up pointing in the same direction. When we consider time, things become dynamic. This is when we study electrodynamics. When we don't consider time, we're studying electrostatics. So, if there's no moving magnet, is our world electrostatic? I'm sorry to tell you, but even if there's no magnet, the curl of the electric field can never be perfectly zero in reality. In our world, there is something called vacuum fluctuation or quantum fluctuation, which doesn't let anything in this world stay at rest. Particles always vibrate, and all of a sudden, we have an oscillating, so curling electric field. We often experience static electricity in our daily lives, right? And you might have learned in high school that the electrostatic effect is caused by stationary charges. So that is not quite accurate. Anyway, if the curl of E is not zero, that automatically means there exists a time-varying magnetic field, right? This is precisely where the electromagnetic wave, which we call light, comes from. So. That's how the third equation was derived. It was a pretty simple derivation. You just had to know the change in the magnetic field and know the concept of right and rule. And in the study of electrostatics, we simply have zero on the right hand side. But if our world isn't electrostatic, then why do we even learn that case? Well, you've got to learn little by little, right? That's just why. 
And in fact, on a macroscopic scale, electrostatics can sometimes be a fair approximation too. So you would still want to learn with the right hand side being zero. Thanks for watching and keep following this series on Maxwell's equations. I'll teach you everything about it. And please, please like and subscribe to my channel. It really motivates me. Thanks.